coming up on this Wednesday edition of Daybreak. A new plea from the Japanese hostage being held by Islamic State. Holding a picture of a captured Jordanian pilot, Kenji Goto says both will be killed within hours if a female terrorist is not released from death row. The US ambassador to South Korea sides with Seoul over Japan's lack of atonement over its wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women, calling the issue emotional and tough. Plus, the government and Hyundai Motor Group are teaming up to turn Korea's southwestern city of Gwangju into a development hub for hydrogen vehicles. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers around the world, it's 6 a.m. on Wednesday, January 28th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. We begin with news that Islamic State militants have threatened to kill two hostages within 24 hours unless a convicted terrorist held in Jordan is released from prison. A two-minute video posted onto YouTube on Tuesday includes an audio statement purportedly read by Japanese captive Kenji Goto in which he relays the demands to secure his release. In the accompanying image, Goto appears to be holding a photo of a Jordanian pilot also held by the terror group. The deadline is thought to expire at 11 p.m. Wednesday, Korea time. That's 17 hours from now. The audio says IS intends to execute the pilot first and then Goto if the prisoner swap is not arranged within the time frame. Tokyo is closely working with Jordan to try and secure Mr. Goto's release but says it's not going to give in to terrorism. The person IS wants freed is... Sajida al-Rashawi, who is a female terrorist who has been on death row for almost a decade after a failed suicide bombing in Jordan. The top U.S. official in South Korea has expressed his support for Seoul in its bitter diplomatic row with Tokyo over Japan's past wrongdoings. U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Mark Lippert said Washington is aware that Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of thousands of Korean women is a highly emotive issue in Korea. Hwang Sang-hee reports. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's seemingly unapologetic attitude about Japan's wartime atrocities is drawing concerns from the United States. In an interview on Tuesday, U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Mark Lippert recognized the gravity of the so-called comfort women issue. Um, the President of the United States, when he was here in April, uh, called the, the treatment uh, shocking. Um, so we, we, um, we, we know that it's, it's tough and a very emotional issue. The unresolved matter of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women has been the biggest thorn in Seoul and Tokyo's bilateral ties. Abe stirred things up this week by hinting that his so-called Abe statement may drop words of apology used in statements by his predecessors. He is set to unveil it this summer to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II. Lippert expressed U.S. support for the existing Kono and Murayama statements and addressed President Park Geun-hye's recent efforts to mend ties. We found that uh, President Park's recent proposal of a trilateral foreign minister meeting uh, as a constructive step that could possibly lead to a trilateral summit. The ambassador welcomed Seoul's efforts to improve relations with Pyongyang, saying the U.S. has no concerns with the speed or scope of the inter-Korean dialogue proposed by President Park. And when will Washington be ready to engage with the communist state? That, he said, is when the North is willing to take steps for a complete, irreversible, verifiable denuclearization of the Korean peninsula. Hwang sang Arirang News. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has thrown his support behind into Korean talks and projects. South Korea's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se held one-on-one -on -one talks with the UN chief on Tuesday on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. During the meeting, Ban conveyed his hopes and willingness to help find a breakthrough between the two Koreas. He also called on Seoul to join global initiatives on climate change and sustainable development and expressed gratitude for Korea's active role in the global fight against Ebola. 
China has clarified its trade position with North Korea after data was released which showed China didn't export a single drop of crude oil to the north last year. A foreign ministry spokesperson said on Tuesday that Beijing has normal trade relations with Pyongyang, hinting that while official documents show the opposite, oil is regularly being shipped to Pyongyang. The remarks come after recently released data from the Chinese Maritime Customs Service showed zero shipments of crude from China to North Korea between January and November last year. Experts say China probably purposely omitted the number to avoid disclosing sensitive figures. Legendary American investor Jim Rogers has long agreed with South Korean President Park Geun-hye that a unified Korea would be an economic force to be reckoned with. Adilang News recently spoke with Mr. Rogers about the prospects of investing in North Korea, South Korea and just an overall unified Korea. Gwon Soa has more. Reunification of the two Koreas would mean a lot for the people of South and North Korea. But for foreigners, ample opportunities to make big bucks, at least for investors. Financial experts from around the world see tremendous business potentials in the northern part of the peninsula once unification is achieved. Jim Rogers, the chairman of Rogers Holdings, a legendary investor with a minimum of 300 million U.S. dollars in assets, voiced his willingness to invest all of his assets into North Korea if the two Koreas are unified. You're going to have a country with 75 million people right on the Chinese border, vast natural resources in the north, huge amounts of cheap, disciplined labor in the north. In the south, you have lots of capital, lots of brains, lots of management ability. It's going to be unbelievably exciting. How big will the economy be? I have no idea, but it's going to be a lot bigger than the combined economy is now. Rogers says while Japan is not fond of the idea of a unified Korea, which will emerge as its strong competitor, China and Russia are already very interested in investing in the North. They've just built two new docks in Razoon. If you look at a map, Razoon is the northernmost ice-free port in Asia. So you put goods into the port, put them on the train, and Russia has just rebuilt the railroad into Razoon, so that's going to be one good that they want it to be, and it will be, a transportation hub going forward. But they've got huge minerals. In 1972, North Korea was richer than South Korea, with vast natural resources. They still have them. They've been ruined by the communists. So you go there, open yourself a mine. Silver, coal, iron ore, there are plenty of things you can do there. The only item the American businessman has purchased so far is North Korean coins due to the many sanctions imposed on the North by the U.S. But Rogers has hope for future investments after meeting with people in the North Korean regime. When asked about which sectors should be targeted, Rogers says underdeveloped North Korea basically needs everything. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And in order to prepare for unification, South Korea hopes to establish an inter-Korean broadcast exchange support center. The Korea Communications Commission says the telecom regulator is drawing up a long-term plan to increase interaction with Pyongyang. Uh, citing how similar activity helped Germany in its reunification, the KCC reports it could begin with small steps like personal or academic exchanges in a third country. On another note, the Commission also promised support for exporting broadcast content by making use of recently signed free trade agreements. The agency is especially focused on ASEAN and China, finalising terms for co-producing content with its Chinese counterpart. Now, working in conjunction with the nation's largest automaker, Hyundai Motor Group, the Korean government has announced a plan to develop the southwestern city of Gwangju into a center for developing and manufacturing hydrogen vehicles. Our Choi Yusan reports. President Park on Tuesday launched an industrial complex in the southwestern city of Gwangju to help Korea emerge as a global leader of fuel cell vehicle production. 
The complex will work closely with the country's largest auto group, Hyundai, to develop next-generation fuel cell cars, widely regarded as future eco-friendly transportation means in the developed world. Fuel cell vehicles, or FCVs, produce zero emission as they are run by electricity generated from a chemical reaction of hydrogen and oxygen in the air. The president said she anticipates a successful integration of Hyundai's capabilities to mass produce fuel cell vehicles and Gwangju's advanced hydrogen technology infrastructure to produce innovation. Compared to electric cars, they can travel up to four times farther in distance from a single charge, with charging taking only three to five minutes. Hyundai Motor is the world's leading maker of FCVs, having started manufacturing the hydrogen version of its Tucson SUV in 2013. It aims to take up half of the global fuel cell vehicle market share by 2018. But other global brands are catching up fast. Japan's Toyota recently started selling its FCV, Mirai, at less than half the price, with hopes to sell more than 3,000 units by the end of 2017. Industry experts say the government and conglomerates should not only focus on R&D, but also investing in infrastructure such as setting up more charging stations to increase sales, which in turn lead to more investments. Another task is to find ways to bring down the sale price by nearly a third from the current $140,000 for a Tucson FCV. Choi yoo Arirang News. Korea is taking steps to strip away cumbersome regulations that stand in the way of innovation in the field of fintech or financial technology. The industry is growing at a staggering pace with uh, large corporations and startups uh, shuffling for space in the highly competitive sector. Al Kang Cherry reports. The day when you can wire money to your friends after just a quick fingerprint or retina scan may not be too far away. Korea's financial authorities have announced a set of measures to make sure the fintech industry, short for financial technology, ensures the ultimate convenience. The transaction limit is set to go up, and the entry barrier is to go down. The idea here is to simplify mobile payments and encourage innovation in finance. In the bigger picture, it's part of the Bakune administration's campaign to deregulate and find new growth engines. The volume of mobile payments has been growing fast in Korea, too, with the total flirting with the $3 billion mark as of the second quarter of last year. And with digital wallets such as Apple Pay and Alipay replacing cash and credit cards, the global market is expected to grow fast. There are security concerns with cyber breaches at major government agencies and banks over the past few years in Korea. Authorities say they are planning to hold the IT companies involved legally responsible and increase the level of compensation if breaches occur. Now, after this latest move to cut to some of the red tape, the focus is on how traditional banks will take to the challenge and how new startups will make names for themselves in the new financial landscape. Kang Chiri, Arirang News. Now, low gas prices at the pump here in Korea have contributed to an uptick in the nation's consumer sentiment, which rebounded in January after falling for the previous three months. Sao Hang Jie has the details. Consumer sentiment in Korea improved for the first time in four months in January. The Bank of Korea says its consumer sentiment index came in at 102 this month, up a single point from a month earlier. The figure, however, is lower than the level posted last May when consumer confidence was hit hard by the Seoul Ferry disaster. Experts also say that the uptick cannot be interpreted as a strong sign of a solid recovery momentum. It's more like the index is reflecting people's hope over the new year that things are going to be better with the drop in global oil prices, giving more leeway for spending. The central bank also says that it's about time for a rebound, adding the index, which reflects consumers' overall economic outlook, has never fallen for three or four months in a row except in cases when there was a major shock in the economy. Still, a reading above 100 means optimists outnumber pessimists. 
In fact, there are conflicting signs that the country's exporters are not faring well. A new survey of around 900 exporters shows that more than a third of them are skeptical about the economic conditions this year. Less than a quarter said they felt positive, while the rest said the conditions should be manageable. Now, all eyes are on the new economic data for the first quarter this year, which will give a clearer picture of whether the domestic economy is on a stable recovery track. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, it's getting harder for people to move up the income ladder here in Korea. A new study shows that the poor are staying poor and the rich are staying rich. Kim ji reports. It's getting more difficult to climb up the social economic ladder in Korea, particularly for those living under the poverty line. A study by the Korea Institute for Health and Social Affairs shows that a mere 23 percent of them escaped poverty in 2014. That's the lowest rate of escape since the first study in 2006. The percentage of people who went straight from the lowest income bracket to the highest without spending time in the middle class increased by a mere 0.3 percent, an eighth of that recorded eight years ago. The study also says the rich are likely to stay rich. More than 77 percent of those in the high income bracket in 2013 remain in the same income bracket in 2014. On the other end of the scale, the number of people who filed for bankruptcy and signed up for debt workout plans hit a record high of 110,000 last year, a near 5 percent increase from a year ago. The study blames labor immobility for the lack of movement across the social economic ladder. 83 percent of those with temporary positions in 2013 said they were unable to find a full-time job in 2014. Nearly 93 percent of those with full-time jobs kept their positions during the same period. Kim Jung, Arirang News. South Korea has been ranked in the top 30 countries in terms of economic freedom. The list, drawn up by the U.S.-based Heritage Foundation, gives South Korea a score of 71.5, which is 0.3 points higher than last year. South Korea also jumped two ranks from 31st to 29th. The country scored relatively high in terms of giving local companies and its finance sector freedom to do business, but it scored poorly in terms of giving freedom to laborers and also in public transparency. Hong Kong, top the list, followed closely by Singapore. North Korea was rock bottom. Time now for a look through the global headlines. We're following on this uh, Wednesday morning from Seoul. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. Another Islamic State attack, this time at a luxury hotel in Tripoli, Libya, has left at least nine people dead, including a Korean. Gunmen stormed the five-star Corinthia Hotel in the North African country on Tuesday, running through the lobby and making it to the 24th floor of the hotel, a space frequently used for diplomatic and government meetings. The gunmen detonated themselves when they were surrounded by security personnel. Guests were evacuated, including Libya's prime minister and an American delegation. AFP reports three security guards and five foreigners were among the dead, including a Korean, an American, a French national, and two Filipinas. A security official had told the news agency the foreigners died when a car bomb was set off outside of the five star hotel. IS Group's Tripoli branch on Twitter said the attack was revenge for Al Qaeda suspect Abu Anas al Libi, who had died in the U.S. earlier this month, days before facing trial for bombing American embassies. And Tuesday marked 70 years since the liberation of the Auschwitz death camp. Not the world leaders and survivors gathered to remember the some 1.5 million people who died at the hands of Nazi troops there, now a symbol of the Holocaust.
The presidents of Poland, Germany, and France joined some 300 Auschwitz survivors in a commemoration held at the death at the site of the death camp. The emotional ceremony was marked by talks by survivors as well, one who challenged world leaders to remember the horrors of the Holocaust when addressing atrocities like those ongoing in Darfur and Kosovo, as well as the recent terror attack in Paris that had targeted a kosher market where four Jews were killed. The event in southern Poland could mark one of the last major anniversaries attended by a large showing of survivors, given that the youngest are now in their 70s. Some 1.5 million people, mostly European Jews, were gassed, shot, hanged, and burned at Auschwitz during World War II before its liberation in the winter of 1945. Turning to politics now, the new Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras has formed his new cabinet that will help him govern the debt-laden nation. At the post of Finance Minister is economist Yanis Varoufakis, an outspoken critic of the bailout conditions imposed on Greece. He will lead the charge to renegotiate renegotiate the country's massive bailout, as was promised by the far-left Syriza Party, a member of the Independent Greeks Party, a Syriza coalition partner, was named to the post of defense minister. U.S. President Barack Obama arrived in Saudi Arabia on Tuesday following his India visit to pay respects after the death of King Abdullah and meet his successor. Mr. Obama held talks with King Salman in Riyadh on Tuesday amid growing instabilities in the Middle East, most recently the mass government resignation in Yemen. The trip, which includes a high-level de delegation from the U.S., shows how important Saudi Arabia is for the U.S. leader that extends from oil interests to regional security to the fight against terror. And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off with our ongoing 2015 Asian Cup coverage as the host nation Australia faced off against the UAE on Tuesday with the winner set to play against Korea on Saturday for the Asian Cup final. And it didn't take long for Australia to get on board as Trent Sainsbury scores just three minutes into the match giving Australia the early 1-0 lead. But we're not done yet. Less than 10 minutes after that is Jason Davison this time. Make that 2-0 Australia. And we're not even done with the first 20 minutes of the match. And what do you know? That's all the scoring here the rest of the way as Australia advanced to the final with the big match against Korea set for this Saturday. Now aside from Korea's first trip to the Asian Cup final in 27 years, the other major sports news in the nation are the ongoing reports of Pak Tae-hwan testing positive for steroids. And now, he's set to face an international hearing. Now, with the Olympic swimmer feeling a test administered by the International Swimming Governing Body, the state prosecutors in Seoul reported that Park received a testosterone injection at the hospital last July. And while the doctor who administered these shots stated that the contents of the injection would be safe, the prosecutors may now charge the doctor of professional negligence. Meanwhile, according to a World Anti-Doping Agency official, Park's penalty will be determined after a hearing with FINA. The PGA season is in full swing, but Korea's Pesang Moon season might come to an end before the end of this week. Well, it's because his military issue hasn't been resolved and he's told to return to Korea. Now, with the 29-year-old unable to receive extension on his overseas visa, he's been asked to return to Korea before the 30th of this month. And while it doesn't seem like the two-time PGA Tour winner is listening to the request, the Tegel Regional Military Manpower Office made it clear that if he doesn't return by the requested date, he will have to face the prosecutors. Meanwhile, he's set to compete this weekend at the Phoenix Open. The 2015 MLB season is still about two months away now, as baseball fans in the nation are looking forward to Lee Eun-jin's third year with the Dodgers. Of course, his first two years were pretty good as he's already won 28 games. But did you know he's number one when it comes to holding the runners in the past two years? Well, it's true as stats show that in the past two years, there's been 578 runners on base with an opportunity to steal a base. But only six runners have actually attempted to steal a base. 
That comes out to an astonishing 96.3% base runner hold rate and number one in the past two seasons. An overlooked stat for many as his ability to hold a runner is actually prevents more runs from scoring. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. A brief cold snap continues today. The lows are kicking off even colder than yesterday at, at a low of minus 8 here in Seoul. And the sensor temperatures drop down to minus 13. So bundle up and cover up from head to toe. And the bone chilling temperature will persist throughout the day with highs only topping out at zero here in Seoul. And more snow is in store for parts of the east. Up to 10 centimeters will fall for the east coastlines, while the rest of the country should have mostly sunny skies. With that in mind, here are the readings for today. So the low in Seoul is kicking off at zero or minus eight that is, and the high will climb to zero, while the high in Daegu and Gwangju will be slightly lower as well, rising to five and three, and Busan will peak at seven this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island will rise to six, Daegu will top out at two, and snowy day continues over in Tokdo. That's all for the weather. Be sure to dress warmly. Thank you very much, Gion, for the weather there. That's going to do it for now. Korea Today is coming up at 7 a.m. Korea time, half an hour. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.